Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the editor-in-chief of TalkHouse Film, and you're listening to the TalkHouse Film Podcast. At some point or other, Terence Nance and Michelle Gondry were always going to meet. The only things in question were the where, when, and how of it all. As it turned out, it was in New York City, on the opening day of Gondry's lovely new movie, the coming-of-age film Microbe and Gasoline, and they were brought together for an episode of the TalkHouse Film Podcast. Nance is the writer-director of An Oversimplification of Her Beauty, a hybrid documentary about unrequited love that incorporates animation into its cinematic tapestry. He's also a musician. He's currently finishing a soundtrack album to accompany the film, and one of TalkHouse Film's most beloved contributors. And as you'll hear in the following conversation, he's a fan of Gondry's, able to discuss his work with familiar ease, but also a kindred spirit, another hopeless romantic whose work, idiosyncratic and personal, is bubbling over with creative invention. Gondry's filmography is substantial and diverse, and in this particular conversation, it happened to be that two of his documentaries, Dave Chappelle's Block Party and Gondry's film-length discussion with Noam Chomsky, Is the Man Who Is Tall Happy, got discussed more than, say, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind or Be Kind Rewind. And when Gondry and Nance got onto the subject of microbe and gasoline, it was the personal, autobiographical aspects of that film that came to the fore in a surprising, profound, and remarkable way. To whet your appetite a little more, I'll let you know that you'll also hear the secret to Dave Chappelle's comic genius and to Noam Chomsky's romantic appeal about Gondry playing the drums with Paul McCartney and Kanye West, Gondry's fear of jokes and his love of the word both, and bookending the conversation is music. It is my hope that the talk has will in future be featuring some of the fruits of a Gondry-Nance jam session, but that deal has yet to be fully hammered out. In the meantime, let's start things as Terence tests out the mic levels by singing a few bars of Designer. Timmy, Timmy, Timmy Turner, I've been wishing for a burner. He, everybody walking. You got it? So you're a singer too? I make music, yeah, too. Oh, cool. Yeah. I call it a show tune funk. Show tune funk? Show tune funk. Show tune funk. Like, uh, like, um, who's the guy who does uh, all the show tunes? Um, summertime in the living is easy. Oh, it's summertime. Uh, yeah, who did that? It's Gershwin, actually. I, I checked it out lately. Like this that. is a song that must have the most cover in the world. A hundred percent. To a point, sometimes it just I get tired of it. No, I mean, you just can't beat the original. That's really, I think, the problem. With the, if the covers were better, or like, you know, progressing the original, yeah, then yeah. you'd be like, all right. Uh, Let's keep it, keep it going. You have that with uh, Aretha Franklin and uh, Respect. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. was taken from Otis Redding, but Aretha Franklin but was it, much better. You're right. Otis Redding, I don't know. But I love Otis Redding. It's yeah. my favorite. <laughs> I feel like Otis Redding, I mean, is politically better with because it means something different from a feminism perspective. From a yeah. woman, you know? But like it just means less. If a guy is like, well, I think at that time, if a black man is saying it, it means a lot. But like, we don't think of that now. Cause yeah, it, and know, for a, a woman to say that, uh, that I understand. It still is, you know, yeah. super relevant. But if you think about it, like Otis Redding was like 21 when he did that. Yeah, he was yeah. like 25 when he died. I worked with uh, Booker T and the MGs. What? was the band. Uh, when did you do that? Uh, when I did Be Can Rewind, uh, oh. I wanted to have uh, Booker T, the k- player, mm-hmm. and um, for a scene, w- unfortunately, was cut in the official version. And uh, I had Steve Cropper as well. Mm-hmm. So we recorded, because I play a bit of drums, mm-hmm. so we recorded uh, a cover of Fats Waller mm-hmm. uh, at the same time. Uh, to be part of the soundtrack. Mm. So I played with those guys who are my uh, total heroes. That's crazy. That'd be like if I can get Stevie Wonder in a room <laughs> and we could like remake Jesus Children of America. Oh, yeah. I want to do that. You know, I, I knew uh, the guy who was, it was like the, f- the fourth uh, member of Beastie Boys uh, and he would do uh, stuff in the back mm-hmm. and he would record them most Mixed of the time. Master Mike. Was that it? Yeah, I think so. What's yeah. his name? 
I think it's Mr. Master Mike. <laughs> Master Mike. He, he, he has his studio mm -hmm. in the backyard of my girlfriend at the time. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, what, what was going on is like between uh, sound uh, engineer, mm -hmm. they are assistant mm -hmm. uh, of uh, engineer, mm -hmm. they, uh, they had access to the multi-track tape mm -hmm. of the... Of of the big band of the big uh, of the band they were uh, recording in this studio. So mm -hmm. he had uh, the dr he had the drums mm -hmm. of uh, keep keep on going. Uh, what what is the name? Keep, is it who's the of it? the Stevie Wonder? Uh, keep on running. Yeah. Keep so he had running. the drum of that track by what? track. Uh, so it's a thing they do. They exchange. Uh, That's this, crazy. Uh, I mean, they put it. They engrave uh, DVD. Oh, that's Money Mark. Money Mark. Okay. Wait, wait. So he has the masters from Music in My Mind in his apartment? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, in the studio. And that's something they did. This is, this uh, in they, New York? He would share it to a guy on an exchange. Uh, the guy would give him, uh, I think he had some uh, track from Queen. Uh. What? <laughs> I, I need to meet this person. It was <laughs> something like, that was I'll going on uh, stuff, in the yeah. assistant. Uh. Wow. Have you seen the most recent tour? He went on tour recently. I know, no. Man, you got to go see him, man. It's yeah? He did um, He did all of Songs of the Key of Life. Okay. In in sequence. And he sounds better than the record. Oh, wow. Which I can't, I can't even, I couldn't have conceptualized before I saw it. Like, I couldn't have fathomed that he could reproduce something better than he captured in the moment he made the song. I mean, maybe, maybe it was just a show I saw, or maybe, it was, you know, maybe I even invented that. Maybe I imagined that it was better. <laughs> it was actually, you know. But it was so amazing. And I think that you have to, you have to check Once it out. Once I went to see a concert that was shot, my DP, she was shooting the concert, and it was lurid, uh, replaying the Berlin album. Oh wow! Is that the one where he's talking about like I'm gonna go to bed stein and score some drugs? I don't know. I don't translate the music <laughs> into words. So I, I just hear the melody, but I don't. Uh, I'm used to not pay attention to the lyrics. Really? But I was not as good as the uh, album. It's interesting you don't listen to Louis. I I thought he was mostly known for his like poetry or like the poetry of what he was saying. Yeah. And, like how. He puts the words together. You do you listen to all music like that? Not really. I mean, <laughs> it's just my memory how it works too. I forget the words very yeah. easily. Ah, that's funny. Like when you listen to rap, is it like that? Like if you listen to like... No, I understand. Because if you don't pay attention <laughs> to the lyrics in the rap, there is not much like... <laughs> I did this documentary with Dave Chappelle and it was very hard to communicate with him because he couldn't yeah. understand my accent and I couldn't understand his <laughs> the way he speaks. Really? Yeah, I mean, we finally figure, uh, figure out a way to communicate. I rewatched that. I was almost there for that movie. I was living in Boston. I was in college or I just got to college and somebody was like, there's a concert with all my favorite musicians at the time. Oh, yeah. And I was like, Oh, I gotta go. I could, you know, I couldn't round up the ten dollars. <laughs> no. Yeah, it was like, I think at that time the Chinatown bus, Feng Hua bus, was like fifteen dollars or something like that, and oh. I, just, I just didn't have it. <laughs> Sorry, you should have called me. <laughs> I didn't have your you number have at the a, time. <laughs> a limo. I know. It was, it was like it's actually the bane of my existence. I can't. I still can't believe that I I wasn't there. You said it was hard to understand, Dave. Is it? Do his jokes land for you? Like, are you? Because I, I know in the black community, Dave Chappelle is why, like, he's like the funniest dude a lot. I think arguably he's the funniest dude kind of out there. Yeah. But like, for you, do you like think of him as that? Not that, you know, you have to make a list of your best, but. Well, yeah, sometimes. But even if you say a joke in French, most likely I won't understand it. <laughs> I get really anxious because I know I'm going to miss the punchline. Now. And uh, those that's, that's a how line in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's funny. But uh, it, no, uh, while he what, told what, me what's, so what, what, what's the problem with missing the punchline? What, what does that mean? Well, you feel stupid. Everybody's <laughs> laughing, and you don't know. 
You don't know why they're laughing. So you have turned. Uh, are you going to show that you didn't understand in not laughing? Or you have to laugh and pretend you understood. But then if anyone asks you what's funny, then you don't know. <laughs> so that happens in your mother tongue as well. That you yeah, yeah, completely. That's because funny. the fact that I'm anxious to understand it, 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 it occupates my mind. Mm -hmm. So then I don't have room left to, to understand the joke. Because I'm obsessed with what's funny but like uh, <laughs> Dave, Dave Chappelle he told me something really uh, important of his method of getting laugh mm -hmm. uh, he said you just speak to the audience and uh, you get them hook and you talk very seriously mm -hmm. until they really want to uh, uh, to understand and, and they, you catch the interest. Mm -hmm. And when you get got them like that, you just say something completely stupid. And That's it's, true. That's his whole method. Yeah. Everything is like about, it's like un, he undermines an otherwise completely serious thing with a moment of just yeah. explosive, like a, impersonating a baby selling crack or something like that, you know. Yeah. That's true. That's his genius. Are you, are you like a, is this movie you've done two movies in France now are you like no more American stuff ever? oh no no no, no. <laughs> okay. I need to street. do a movie in America do you where do you live not to, I mean uh, in between cannot. France and New York and sometimes Los Angeles okay yeah you, you you said you need to do an American movie now yeah I think so why 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 um why are the stakes high well it's uh well, it's, it's smaller in France. I mean, it sounds a little bit trivial to 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 talk about it like that, but uh, I have the luck to be able to do both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good if I come back here mm. for my next project, which I don't know what it will be. Oh, I, I went. I shot a movie in France last year in Marseille. And it was like being on vacation and making a movie kind of yeah. a little bit like, so I imagine that it, there's probably no element, maybe there's, you're more used to America. I had never made a movie in France before, but it was like, everyone treated me better. Maybe, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like I got that, like I was the guest, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it felt like somewhere between vacation and work. <laughs> so you shot a movie there? Yeah, it was just, it was a short film. Um, I'll send it to you, but it's like, it's called Uni Vitelan. It's about two people who are the same person and they fall in love and then they get into existential crisis because they're the same person. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. And then they die. But the um, do you get that feeling when you're here? Like mm. the, the, you're the guest... Who, uh, the honored guest. Well, uh, yes, I understand what what you mean, uh, and uh, but I mean, I, I did I started to do movies after I did tons of videos, oh, yeah, true. and most of them were either in England or uh, in the US. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I was more at home here than in France, mm. and it took me uh, two or three movies before I. Uh, I went back to France and had the courage to do a movie because I don't think I was really welcome there. As I have a, mm. they have in my, I mean the critics and in general they have they are very uh, suspicious and critical uh, with somebody who's coming from the video world. Mm. They are more forgiving for somebody who's just come out of uh, film school. <laughs> I don't really understand why, uh, hmm. but so I felt more uh, at home here. Hmm. That's interesting. And my English uh, sounds bad, but I think I have enough vocabulary to. Uh, Your English is fantastic. What are you talking about? <laughs> I remember the first video <laughs> was for Terence and Derby. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've never seen that, and I have to see it. Right? <laughs> so I need to pull that. And out. I remember I had to. P we created the front of a movie theater, and uh, 
the we had to pick a color to paint the columns on, on the or the wall or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, the art director came to me and asked oh you want the wall to be uh, red or blue and i said yes <laughs> 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 but what then color I, did they paint it? <laughs> that purple or well, something? Well, <laughs> I think they came back to me and say, well, you have to pick a color. <laughs> but then I learned my favorite word uh, in, in English that doesn't in exist in French. It's uh, both. It doesn't? It, le même? Le no, deux? it's uh, two of them. The two of them uh, you say right. in French. You're right. It is... Uh, but so it's funny, it's really, uh, it's really uh, handy because uh, if you don't want to make up your mind, you just say both. True. <laughs> Do you want big horse and small horse? I say both. <laughs> That's true. That's, yeah. Well, I mean, the We're English, so English language is good f to work. Maybe not as good to express, express feelings, but to work on, it's more direct. I mean, it's nuances, it's not. A huge difference. I found. I mean, I don't. My French is really, really hit or miss. But I found like having to direct a movie with a French crew and talk to them in French made me really, really clear and like direct. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I may, maybe it was the same. Like that when you have to force yourself to a limited vocabulary or something. Yeah, and I think one of the positive side in working in a foreign country with a foreign crew is you can't micromanage. <laughs> you have to let people do their work and you can really focus on what's important, which is directing the actors. Do you have a tendency to micromanage in France when you're in France? Yeah, or even here. And I know it's not good and I know it doesn't make the film look good because <laughs> you pay too much, uh, too much attention to the detail. Yeah, but yeah, I think I'm really uh, convinced about that. Because well, you, you're gonna spend uh, the same amount of energy to shoot uh, uh, a cup of coffee in close-up than uh, uh, a close-up of a face, uh, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous. Uh. <laughs> and when I went to, sh I did a, a short film in uh, Japan in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and really nobody really spoke English. I had a translator, which is a nightmare to go through <laughs> it so i decided i would let everybody do their job how they do it normally that movie's great that's the one where she turns into a chair yeah that movie's great so you did it you proved your theory <laughs> <laughs> for instance the dp he stopped a shot because he felt the lens was wrong and if it has been it ha had been in front i would have yelled at him like crazy because <laughs> i think uh, who are you to stop the shot? And it's my decision. <laughs> and uh, I'll just, th I was upset, but then I thought to myself, uh, well, maybe that's the way they work here. So mm -hmm. I will respect it and uh, I'm not going to get upset. And the fact is, it was uh, one of the best DP I ever worked with. That is one of your best looking movies. I was Yeah, say. it looks You should great. get that guy again. Yeah, it's true. And he doesn't speak uh, a word of English. That's for your American movie. You got to bring him in. Yeah, he's great. it's like uh, in there is a Woody Allen movie where the DP is blind. Which one? <laughs> uh, it's a great, uh, he's a Chinese guy and he's, uh, he, he doesn't see. So he has somebody who tell him the frame and, and he's a DP. That's beautiful. That's yeah, like it's a great Be idea. Beethoven I mean, and yeah, exactly. Hear the That's great. I wanted to go there on my own oh. and emerge myself and work with only Japanese people. Because okay. I really don't like people uh, who go to a foreign country and they take their key mm -hmm. crew. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's missing the point. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing a movie in Japanese with Japanese actors in, in a Japanese location. I think it would be stupid to bring a French DP, mm -hmm. a French gaffer, and so on. Mm -hmm. And as well, he on, it's undermi it undermines the people working there. Gotcha. Because then you take uh, people uh, from the country just for the lower post, lower mm -hmm. position, yeah. and uh, they get frustrated. It's like feudalism or something, or like some exploitative system. <laughs> yeah, it's like colon it's like colonizing yeah, it's literally. Exactly <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's exactly like a colony where bringing uh, the missionaries to yeah. teach the. 
Yeah, exactly. Local view. Yeah, and, and, and then if you think of it, Japan is a, is a big, bigger uh, movie country than France. It is. And we shot wow. actually in the Kurosawa studio. What? That was you cool. got you got all the dreams that came true. Every single one of them. Yeah, but I turn it <laughs> I turn them into nightmares. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, true. No, that's really. But it's true. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I play the drum with Paul McCartney. Jesus. Uh, with uh, Kanye West. Was that a dream you had? Did you <laughs> play? Wait, well, did you yeah, play I really. I think I mean, Kanye West is amazing. I mean, for everything. No, I do too. I was just asking. I was just thinking, like timeline wise, at what point you dreamt you dreamed it to when it came true. Well, playing with Paul McCartney was pretty high ranked. <laughs> it's like uh, interviewing Noam Chomsky is pretty. Yeah, that's really high. Pretty high. Yeah. Now he must, but I mean, if you had anxiety about getting punchlines of jokes, d- didn't you have a lot of anxiety of just sort of understanding the, I guess, you know, when it, the thesis of what he's saying in yeah, every of moment? Course. I mean, you can see that in a movie. Sometimes yeah, sure. I try you say to, it. Yeah. to come across <laughs> with an idea and it just dismisses me. It's yeah. very nice, but s- sometimes it's just going to uh, kill you if, if he doesn't agree with what you say. One of the strongest parts of that movie is when he's talking about his wife and like losing her and what that, fe- like visualizing that, what that felt like. Did you ever talk to him about, I can't, maybe it is in the movie, I'm just forgetting it, but you talking about like your love life or anything like that. Did he, did he like, I imagine there's stuff on the cutting room floor that grew into some sort of more personal conversation. Well, he always says that he doesn't like to talk about his personal life uh, mm. because it's not more interesting than anybody else's life. And I think it's mostly because he's shy and guarded. Um, but he kept referring to his wife mm. all uh, the way through the interview. Mm-hmm. It reminded me a bit. Uh, you remember the TV show Colombo? No. It's this detective played by Peter Falk. He mm-hmm. was huge in France. And uh, so he was a very odd character. And he was always talking about his wife. You never s- get to see his wife. <laughs> and uh, Chomsky sort of reminded me uh, of him. Because mm. in every chapter or, or subject he would approach he he would mention her hmm. so at some point uh, we were talking uh, about something and then i ask well he was talking about his feeling about death and he doesn't really care about it <laughs> uh certainly not afraid and then i s- i continue by asking him uh, what about when your wife passed away and then that touched him he was uh, in a verge of breaking uh, in tears so it's very yeah. sentimental uh. so like he didn't want much. to talk about it but then uh, he talked about her uh, mm-hmm. and again and again but since he remarried i don't know if you know about that no he find a wife uh, a girl in uh, brazil uh, that's uh, the be- one of the probably a good place to look yeah <laughs> and she's 50 uh, she's very beautiful uh. <laughs> and she's a documentary uh, uh filmmaker you know you made that happen though it's probably she probably uh, maybe, watched the movie it was know. like oh he's single and no then, my conclusion is like if you uh, <laughs> are the smartest person in the world you can get a pretty woman when you're 86 <laughs> so i need to study okay but we'll he says something that was beautiful uh, when he was interviewed on the, um, democracy now he said that for all the well he said first uh, he got the luck to meet uh, i forgot her name and he said and she fell into my arms which hearing that from shomsky that that's that like as <laughs> flowery <laughs> as yes <laughs> and then he said for all the horrible things happening in the world life is not worth living without love Whoa. Yes, huh? so you don't expect him to talk about that. Huh? No. No, he's much more sentimental than people expect. You softened him, or you created a pathway for his... Oh, I don't know. I don't think I had anything take to do with credit. that. <laughs> take some credit. Take some credit. Okay, fine, that's, that's me. No, that's funny. So th- this movie is... Um, I mean, it felt like you you repeated a line from the main character just now, kind of colloquially, unintentionally. So yeah. I'm assuming that the main character is you was sort of a, a biographical situation. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the microbe is me when I was 14. Yeah. And it is, I have two brothers as well. And I, what I liked about it, I was the runt. And it's, you know, I was the littlest one. Yeah. But um, I liked that uh, it, sh- you know, it showed a kind of more realistic than I've ever seen in a movie bullying dynamic. I don't know if you could even call it that, where the kid who's being picked on isn't actually powerless. Like he, he's has he's socialized. He's got yeah. brothers, and like it's not like this. Hey, Poindexter, give him a wedgie, throw him in the toilet type of thing. Yeah. But he has like social power. People like him. Generally, the the nickname is not that bad of a nickname. Yeah. You know, I I really I've and I feel like. When I watched the trailer, I thought it was going to be very, like... Yeah, I just saw this. <laughs> so I was, like, really presently surprised that it was, like, so, I guess, true to life, you know? At least from what I remember from being 14. <laughs> yeah, well, know. that's my experience. I mean, yeah, I had a place in the in the class. I was not completely... Uh, a loser what was happening was that i had much more common interest with girls and boys mm. i found the boys to be a little immature and uh, showing off and mm-hmm. and i found the girl to be much more fun and uh, mm-hmm. nice to hang out with them the problem is one of these girls i was in love with and uh, I realized with the years that uh, because it it lasted a few years uh, that uh, this position of being friend was in a way of being a uh, boyfriend mm. and that was a bit devastating to to realize that I read in some interview you talk about I don't remember what it was about or what movie it was about but it was like some you, you said it was like really depressing the idea of Time travel is really depressing because going back in time in the past would mean you'd have no hope for the future or something like that. But then you said that if you went back in time, you would fix, you would go after the girl or some abstraction Oh, yeah, girl. yeah, it was, was my it, experience. Was, <laughs> was this that, that girl? Yes, f- of course, yes. I don't know if we could make it better. But uh, <laughs> what happened as well is like, up to 45 or 50, I was thinking, uh, and I would see a uh, friend hanging around or people that were in their 20s. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, well, they have much life, much more life ahead of them than me. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, but on the other hand, uh, there is little chance that some of them, I mean, it's sort of arrogant to think this way, but that's what I was thinking. There was sort of little chances that uh, they would accomplish uh, things like I did. I'm not saying that I had the most uh, outstanding accomplishment, but in comparison to most of the kids of, mm-hmm. of, of uh, this age or this group of people, uh, it was, it would be, even it would even the fact that I was much older than them, mm-hmm. uh, which was uh, sucking basically. <laughs> but then when I went over uh, fifty, I uh, this shifted. <laughs> I still I would rather be their age and not do anything. <laughs> I still have more life ag- ahead of me. But it's true as well. Uh, coming if I could come back. Uh, to this age, uh, would find a way maybe to uh, to end up with this girl. But don't you think that's like all in your mind? Like, however old you actually are, which I don't even know. Like, you can just be twenty if you want. Like, you can not that not and maybe a, I mean maybe don't do that. But like, in like a, <laughs> you know, like you can conceive well, you are of 20, your future. Well, you You have the same person. Only yeah, thing exactly, is, well, yeah. once you are dead, you can't. Get, but you can't be 20 anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh... Well, I mean, like, what... Okay, I guess when I was watching the movie, I was watching it and I was thinking of... 
his dilemma with this with Laura Lauren Laura. Laura Laura and I was thinking you know I thought about um, the main character in Eternal Sunshine and, I, and the couple at the end of We and I and like all the sort of stilted romance and I was like what is your love life like like that was my main thing. <laughs> what is my love what life is your, like yeah like why it's a disaster <laughs> Is it a disaster or is it like a ride? Is it like a roller coaster? You know what I mean? Like, is yeah. it like an earthquake or a roller coaster? Earthquake. It's an earthquake. So you have no control. You didn't even get on. It just happens. You mean in general or for the, in this relationship? I guess right now. Like, while you were making this movie, what was it like? I can't even talk about <laughs> it. It leaves you speechless. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. I say my girlfriend was pregnant and she dumped me. See how bad it can be. <laughs> that is the. I say it here because she would never uh, hear it. I. I hope she won't. Wait, wait. She was Sorry. pregnant with you all's child. Sorry, with with, with you, my child. With your child and she yeah, dumped and we're you. We're still trying to make it work, but this is a roller coaster. So what? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, okay, all sperm, my questions the are answered. Is terrible. <laughs> wow. So is that? But is that is that typical of like your whole? Is that well, situation? This, this is one that's really sort of fun to talk about, mm -hmm. and you can describe <laughs> the, the gravity of the situation in one sentence. <laughs> so that's why I I, <laughs> I talk about it like that. No, and each film I've done reminds me of uh, a breakup or uh, which generally is me being dumped <laughs> uh, so it's painful to watch them because they're all attached to this relationship that end up uh, maybe I should draw a conclusion and try to change something <laughs> <laughs> not switch it up. <laughs> well there's I mean for, it's, to me the movie is like So, so the I guess I'm very much the type of person that looks back. Like at the end of the movie when he doesn't look, I mean, nobody, watch the movie before listening to this. But in the movie when he doesn't look back, yeah. like I feel like I live the life where I looked back and we end up together, most, uh -huh. mostly. And when he doesn't look back, like I, like the, the universe of me relating to it kind of didn't completely stop, stop because I am, I'm very much him. Uh-huh. The whole movie, like that's, I was, you know, had the same sort of, I was in the same social role. Uh -huh. And then when he doesn't look back, like the hopelessness of that was like, what? <laughs> like what? So then, you know, I couldn't on some level deal with that. So you, you know? were upset? I, I felt, I felt, um, I felt bad for you. <laughs> for me <laughs> yeah because i knew it was like from a real thing like yeah. a real you know because I, i mean knowing also knowing that she felt that way about you you know the avatar of you you know it means that you know that she felt that way about you that it's not like a mystery oh well you know what i mean in real life what happened is uh i went to another school she went to another school and uh 20 years later, when I saw her again, she told me that at this point she was in love with me. But I didn't know. So maybe that's even worse. <laughs> it's even worse, yes. <laughs> and then I talked to her and, and she had changed. I could not go and kiss her or whatever. It's, I was not attracted to her. So that's happened to me, though. That's definitely happened. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I guess I never really knew. I never... I guess I never had the... 20 years later conversation but yeah it made me feel bad but th but then there's like but then in 2020 hindsight you realize there's like all the joy that is in the process of wanting like yeah, i don't know there's a lot of like uh, may i understand what you say the the joy but uh i think that you can conclude to the fact it was joy if you end up together <laughs> if you never end up together it's uh it's painful Yeah. But on the other hand, if you were not sort of artistic or you yeah. have this uh, sensibility, uh, you would not be uh, an artist. Or True. 
So unfortunately, unfortunately, I mean, the, the sorrow of uh, failure, sentimental failure, fills uh, your creativity or your creativity mm. f uh, fills the fact that you are sentimentally a failure. True. Well, when you look back, like on, you know, I, first time I told a girl I loved her, I was 14 or 15. And um, I, I I thought I meant it. And when she broke up with me, I was like, I think I'm gonna die. Now. I think I'm dead, you know. But now I question the, um, I guess the authenticity of authenticity of that feeling. I don't question the reality of it, and that it was like real for me then. Yeah. But do you feel like, you know, in remembering? the nostalgia of that, that it was like what you would call love now? Well, if you try to look at it in an objective way, you could think that's a not a real love. It's more a uh, needy love. Mm -hmm. uh, it's maybe something to fill up a lack of something you have. Mm -hmm. But then uh, it seems to uh, intellectualize and bring some psychology yeah, yeah. into the thing. Uh, but I remember clearly when she, it's what is weird is she, I, rem I have two memories of her dumping me. Well, we never went together. <laughs> went out together, it was just like, and actually she dated my brother, my big brother after. So it was, <laughs> it's the worst. That's the worst. Your uh, big brother is a terrible, like what is going on with him? I know, you know what, maybe he's the <laughs> nicest guy now, but I still dream uh, of him being mean to me. Like, for instance, with my best friend, uh, the, we were doing magic trick in front of our parents mm -hmm. in an evening. And uh, so you, you have some rings and you do stuff, uh, they are broken and you can put them like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, underneath, it was my little brother giving us the mm -hmm. thing. And my uh, big brother, he would come and pull up uh, the, the sheet. <laughs> so he will uh, uh, unveil the whole uh, thing. <laughs> and that was the type of thing he was doing. Oh, I was playing basketball. Uh, we were playing basketball in the same team. And if I was looking away, he would throw me the basketball in my head. Uh, so there is many examples where He's I really... really jealous of you. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it was frustrating. But... Thinking back to events with this uh, girl, there are patterns that I still mm -hmm. carry. I would do a drawing of cats, I remember. I mean, mm -hmm. I make fun of it in the movie, mm -hmm. but I did actually drawing of three little cats and they were super uh, detailed. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember she had it in her room. And I remember being with friend in her room and looking at her lips and thinking I would never kiss his lips. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> and I could not possibly imagine that I uh, being in love with another girl, even for the rest of my life. Are you monogamous? Like, by nature? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, do you feel, like, I know I'm not monogamous. Uh -huh. So, like, I know that I don't process the world from a monogamous framework even if i am just with one person yeah. at, at any given moment so do you do you feel like i mean at that moment you clearly felt monogamous but do you feel like your life has played out in a way that well i think that? how it works for me is that if i'm in love with a woman mm -hmm. or girl uh there is this pattern in when i uh, hope for the relationship to happen i'm totally monogamous because a any other girl uh don't uh it's not up to the same level mm -hmm. in, in in my uh view uh then the relationship if it happens same and then there is moment where uh, the relationship is not based on uh, unbalanced love or desire it balances out and you're just having good time mm -hmm. then i can start to look around and fancy other girl not that i'm gonna do a, a move <laughs> but i think but i think uh, my issue is uh 
I think love is this moment of frustration of not getting the girl uh, mm. I want. And then when the relationship works, it happens sometimes. Uh, <laughs> that should be the real love, but mm-hmm. I don't see it this way. So love is the conflict. Love is the un- it's an is unrequited inherently. It's yeah. Like, man, that's terrible. I know. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks for saying that. Do you go to couples therapy? No, I think I will, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just started it like not too long ago. It's, it's it's interesting. I mean, it has its. Maybe I shouldn't say this publicly. <laughs> no, actually, I went to three already or two. I was horrible because I was crucified by my girlfriend each time. What do you mean by crucified? Like she. Well, because she talks about things she would never have said to me, and then let's say she doesn't <laughs> love me anymore, but she would not say I don't love you anymore. And then she's going to say to the therapist, uh, and it's just like devastating. So she uses the form of therapy as a kind of like buffer to like throw out things that she feels like would be too dangerous to throw out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the goal of the therapy. It's like everybody says what he feels, yeah. regardless of uh, how it may hurt a partner. Yeah, true. I think for me, the experience has more been about like, translation like she says something to the therapist the therapist knows that i my worldview is different so she'll translate what my wife has said to me you're married yeah cool so (laughs) it's like it's it's yeah she's like a she's a translator between terrence language and my wife's language Uh, theoretically that's a good uh that's a good view of it I think I guess in my situation I went there at a point where my girlfriend wanted to leave me. Oh yeah. So it's she's not coming to fix and she's no. coming to uh Disassemble. just uh <laughs> to make the relationship relationship explode. <laughs> That's painful. I really hope not. I really hope. Well it's you're still working on it though, right? Oh, this is a whole other one. This is a That's different a, one. Uh, okay. But we decided we would go to couple therapy. One more question. Uh, what is the question going to be? Um, I have silly questions. Go ahead. Are you still making any music? And can we make some music together in the sure. future? I play, I play gu- I write drums. Guitar, I write on guitar. And play guitar and sing. You yeah. play drums. I play drums on a bit of keyboard. What I do, I cheat. Uh, so I play the drum for five minutes, and we take the four bar that are really the nicest one, and we loop them. That's not cheating. Every everybody does yeah. that. <laughs> that's, that's and then the I play the bass. Uh, my uh, hero bass player is uh, Bernard Edwards from uh, Chic. Okay. So I play the bass on same thing. I do uh, just play one, one chord, one chord, one chord, one chord, <laughs> and then it sounds really funky. Uh, and Let's I do put it. Some chord. Uh, I like my. I'm I'm a J- James Jamerson is my guy, but bass wise, he played like all the uh, Funk Brothers stuff. Okay. You gotta get into it. You'll love it. But yeah, let's do let's do some, let's just jam. You know what I mean? Like. You live in New York sometimes. Yeah, so, Brooklyn. <laughs> so we'll do. Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn too. So we'll do it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. It, yeah. This is Nick Dawson from Talk House Film, and you've been listening to Terence Nance and Michelle Gondry on the Talk House Film podcast. This episode was engineered and edited by Talk House podcast producer Elia Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to TalkHouse Film and TalkHouse Music Podcast on iTunes, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs>